Mostly because I used to have quite long hair and didn't have many haircuts. Um, I was at school once upon a time. And my friends used to give me a hard time because I was a bit short. Um, they used to say I was vertically challenged. I don't know if it's a... Um, someone's actually hung a tape measure here. I'm not sure if they're trying to make fun of me, but I'm actually five foot ten when I stand up straight now. Well, five foot nine and a half. And uh, that's about the average height. And I've checked. Trust me. Um, so, yeah, they said I was vertically challenged. And um, in my later years, hopefully I won't become follically challenged, uh, which is where your hair falls out. And uh, some of your parents might be becoming follically challenged. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe you could ask your dad, how, how's your follicles? Um, don't say it too quickly, because he might become offended and think you said something rude to him. Um, try not to trip up. Um, so, what I'm getting at is that some people believe that Gisborne might be geographically challenged and we're out on a limb here on the East Coast and the East Coast may be even more so and um, we're quite a long way away from everywhere else and there's been a bit of media and um, things written in the press about how because our um, education system is on the edge of the country we're slightly um, seen to be a bit different. Um, I want to talk today about how maybe that might limit some of our opportunities and see if it really makes much of a difference to us here on the East Coast. Um, so, it's of the opinion that um, Gisborne is geographically, um, geographically challenged, but I think that's a really good thing. I've listened to a few people over the last few days say how wonderful it is to be on the East Coast, and I completely agree with them. I love this place. And I love nothing better than walking down to the beach and on a Saturday morning have, have no one else on the beach and going out on the sea and getting some really, really good waves. And Warren yesterday spoke about how he finds um, this area to be an area where he feels really inspired because of the countryside around us and all the beautiful things that we've got. And same with Trudy. She's come back here to work and she's been able to work and manage a really successful company from being on the East Coast. Um, so I want to see how that, how that ties into learning. And um, I want to try and maybe give you an example, which I've been using in PE and sport, um, of how we can extend ourselves beyond our uh, geographical boundaries. So first of all, I want to think about um, what is learning. And learning is a uh, relatively permanent change in your behavior through actions and through repeating things. And um, the way we learn is through experience. And it's through experimenting, and it's through discussing, and it's through talking, and it's through um, listening to other people and reading. The average adult reads over, uh, or listens to, over 100,000 words in one day. And that's quite a lot of information to process. And we need to think, is that information which we're processing useful for us? Or is it just reading an update Facebook page of what people have had for breakfast or what they're going to have for dinner or something that they saw on TV? Is it things which we can learn from? I've decided to... Um, just put this picture up of a Chinese, Chinese writing, and Chinese is actually spoken by one-fifth of the world's population. And China has the um, second largest economy in the world, which is probably something which might be useful to learn if you want to make some money. Learn a bit of Chinese and you can get into that market. Um, so anyway, going back to how we communicate and we listen to 100,000 words a day, um, who do we learn from? Yesterday, uh, I listened to Carolyn Stewart and she talked about how our education model is looking at still being in an industrial age. And this is a picture from that. And you can see um, the teacher there. Here she is. She's the font of all knowledge. And she's the person which is telling you what you're learning. It's a one-way process almost. This kid hates it so much he's out the door. He's, a, he's just a blur. Um, but all the, other, all the other children are listen atten listening attentively to the, uh, to the teacher. And um, the way things are going, things are, things are changing slightly. And I know that you guys are probably involved in some of that. Um, in the way that you're learning right now. What I want you to think about is if you could learn from more people, at the moment we're learning from Fano, we're learning from um, people we connect from, from our teachers, if we can expand that, can we learn to a better quality? Or is it a case of quality over quantity? Or is it uh, the other way around? Um, so the main, main way we can learn is through observational learning, watching it. And I chose this, this slide because it's quite clear these guys here watching this fellow climb up to the climbing wall, and they've watched every step he's taken, they've watched every um, hold he's got into. And what they should be doing is watching what he did, and then if they can think to themselves, maybe if I do the same thing, I can probably take a different route at the top and actually get higher than him. I can take it to the next level if I observe what he's doing and put my own twist on it and change it and try and add something on there. 
Um, so by observational learning, we're actually watching people doing this. There's been quite a lot of experiments done on this, and the most famous one is uh, Bandura's social learning theory. Have any of you guys heard of that? Any students studied psychology? No? All right. Um, what Bandura did in the 70s is he got two groups of children. Um, they must have been three to five years old. And in one room, room A, let's call it, the children um, watched an adult with this big inflatable doll, and the adult was really nice to it, showed socially responsible behavior, played with it nicely, spoke to it, and was really kind. That was room A. In room B, there was an adult and a doll and 20 children, and they watched um, the adult be really mean to this doll. And the adult was, she'd get it in a headlock and start smashing it, smashing it in the stomach, uh, or jump on it and um, be really mean and physically abuse this doll, which was no good. And you guys can probably guess what happens next, because you're humans, and it's human nature to learn from what we observe. But Bandura let the children, one by one, into the room with the doll. And the students who were in room A were really nice to the doll. And they um, spoke to it and made it a cup of tea and said, here we go, you know, we're really nice to you. And the students who were in room B went in and they picked up, picked, there was a hammer in the room, they picked up a hammer and started hitting the doll with a hammer. And there was a toy gun. You can watch the footage on the internet. And there was a toy gun and they started pretending to shoot the doll because of what they, what they witnessed, what they observed. And I think that's really important for us today through observational learning and thinking about a lot of the things that you guys watch on the internet. Just, just be careful of what you're looking at all the time because a lot of that stuff fills your mind and subconsciously you'll start to reflect that behavior. I want you to think about doing that perhaps in a positive way. Um, the next stage of learning after we've, after we've watched it, watch the guy climb to the top, put your own twist on it, get, get to the next level, is the associative stage and that's the actual doing it. Okay, and this is all really traditional learning theory, um, but as a PE teacher this is, this is a lot of what I um, tend to talk about. And associative learning is where we strengthen the stimulus response bond in our, in our brains to do with positive or negative reward and feedback. Um, a good example of that would maybe you try to do a, f a front flip and you land on your face and it's a negative response. Okay, you've done it wrong. You're going to try and do it again. So that behavior is then changed. Um, there's a few more theories about associative behavior and um, one of them is by um, a guy called Pavlov. Have any of you guys heard of that? Any, any more psychologists? Yep. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Bubbles. Pavlov's dogs uh, is an experiment where he used dogs, yep. uh, meat powder, and a bell. And what he did was he got the um, dogs to sniff the meat powder. And as they sniffed the meat powder, it's a bit like all of us where we drive past KFC, we start to salivate. And we smell those beautiful aromas, and we're like, oh, I wouldn't mind, a, I mean, wouldn't mind a bite of that. And they um, repeated that with the same dog again and again and again. And every time he saw the meat powder, he started to salivate. The next stage that he put in was he rang a bell. And every time that they brought the meat powder out, they rang the bell. And um, the dog started to associate that with the meat powder. The next stage, they took the meat powder away and they rang the bell. What do you think happened with the dog? Yes, good student there, well done. He, uh, the dog salivated. And that's from doing something, repeating it again and again. It increases the, the, the bonds in your brain to help you learn something. Um, so once we've learned all these skills, um, the final refinement stage is um, to do with this. I just want to talk about this picture to start with. You can't see it, but underneath where it says slide seven here, this is a reasonably famous painting by an artist called Degas, who was an artist in the 1870s. And you might notice something different about this picture. Anyone tell me what it is? And it, yeah, our mate Simon's in the picture. Here he is. Um, it's actually a modified piece of art by a, an artist from where I'm from in the West Country called Banksy. And if any of you guys are really keen on um, urban art or graffiti, look him up because he's got some really, really good pieces of art. However, I'm not sure... I mean, there's always, you can always critique art, but I'm not sure how much art this is. Um, Simon Cowell actually commissioned this piece um, by Banksy, and it cost him $800,000. I'm not an artist, I'm a teacher, but I think I could have done that. Um, it's, a <laughs> it's a pretty good concept. But the reason why I chose it is because Simon Cowell is so famous for giving feedback. He's an expert at it. And the sort of feedback he gives is external feedback. And that's where we learn um, or receive input from other people, from outside of us. Um, the other sort of feedback is internal feedback, and that's really important. That's how you feel after you've done the performance and you tell yourself what you've been doing. Um, so feedback really needs to be immediate. 
and it needs to be honest and it needs to be from respected people and although he's a bit of a mean man Simon Cowell is really respected and if you're keen on doing performance or if you're keen on singing and dancing and you re receive some positive feedback from Simon it's double thumbs up it's really good and everyone's really happy about it um, so what would it look like if we combine all these things he's watching it the doing it the feedback we can do that the tool which I've been using is a tool which allows us to do it whenever we want. And with the ubiquitous nature of the internet, you can do that at any time and anywhere and um, interact with any people. For us on the East Coast, that enables us as learners because we can do those sorts of things from up the coast, from, from in Gisborne, from at Wainui, from wherever you may be. And the, um, the tool I've been using is called Coach's Eye. And I've been using it with my senior students uh, my level one and level two boys, and I've also been using it with my year 10 boys, and it's just a really simple app which um, runs on your iPad. I won't demo it now, I was going to get people out, but I thought it might all go catastrophically wrong, so we might do that at the end. And um, it allows you to break down your skill performance, and you can see there on the picture that the, um, the girl's got writing or, or lines on her leg analyzing the biomechanics. And if you're a keen sprinter and you're on the East Coast, you could get some footage of Usain Bolt, look at his start. I mean, he's one of the fastest men in the world, and analyze it again and again and again, and compare it to your performance. You could do it for horse riding, you could do it for trampolining, you could do it for surfing, you could do it for anything um, which involves a physical movement. And this is the sporting element of the um, things I'm going to talk about you today. There's a quick video which I, I've got to apologize because it um, is a really American video, but uh, we'll watch it and see what they say about it. Cheesy, but put the point across. Um, lovely, wrapped it up there. He used the word tele, telestratic, I think. Does anyone know what that means? I don't know what it means either, but I think what, he, what he's talking about is drawing on the picture and um, getting an angle of uh, what you're supposed to be doing. So that's one example, okay? And it's in a sporting context. And I know a lot of you guys might not be into sports, so you might be into something completely different. But um, what I'd like to talk to you is about perhaps applying that to your life or thinking about um, thinking about doing what this guy's doing here. I chose this picture because this guy's trying to connect here with this fellow here. He's not actually doing it the best way because the string needs to be taut. But I'm not going to give him a hard time about it because either he's extremely cold or he hasn't got a hand. So we'll let him off. But um, what I think you guys can, can learn a lot from is watching things on the internet. And YouTube's a reasonable example. YouTube also has an edu channel, forward slash edu. And you can learn a, an amazing amount of wealth from this. I bought an old 1974 Land Rover Series 3. And there's a few of those up the coast I've seen because I've always been looking for parts when I've been driving up the, up the coast. But the um, brake system failed. And I had to really um, overhaul the complete brake system of the Land Rover. I'm not a mechanic. I'm a PE teacher. But I taught myself how to do that from watching it on YouTube. It's the same if you're keen on maybe graphic design or Photoshop. You can look at tutorials 
and I'm not a graphic designer, but I've managed to teach myself how to use InDesign, a really powerful Adobe program, completely from YouTube and tutorials on the internet. So if you think you might be keen on something, just, just look it up and find out and learn. And it's not necessarily learning the skills, it's the ability to learn a skill, which is going to carry you guys a lot further forward in your lives. Also the ability to sift through the useless information, because I know a lot of the time you guys will go on YouTube and you'll look at top 10 school fights or something like that. And for us, really, that's not too important. Okay? Um, the next way you can do this, and I've been using this for my students, and that's Google+. Plus. And that's a social network. And Warren yesterday talked about social networking and the power of it, and it allowing you to meet anyone in the world. 20 years ago, I was told this, and my teachers told me this, don't talk to strangers. Don't interact with anyone. If you're walking down and someone asks you for an ice cream, don't get involved with those guys. But now, we're asking you to talk to strangers. We're asking you to interact with other people and learn from them. And the reason why Google Plus is so good and I'm not sure if any of you have ever used that, but Google Plus is so good because you can follow other people and it's not stalking. On Facebook, if you start saying, be, be my friend, be my friend, be my friend, it's a little bit stalking people because you're supposed to be friends and know the people on Facebook. On Google Plus, you're not supposed to know them. So if you're interested in, in wrestling or if you're interested in motorbikes, you can follow the best people in the world who are into, that, into the motorbikes or into the equine horse racing and you, can, and you can connect with those guys. Um, some of you guys might have seen the Khan Academy. I know some boys at our school have used it. And it's the whole um, underpinning of the flipped learning method, where you guys go home, watch the video, learn about something, and then come back to school and discuss it. And the Khan Academy is not the only one where you can do that. There's lots of other examples of where you can learn from videos online. And I've been using it with my classes. And there's even some um, level 1 and level 2 PE videos available. And it's available for all, all, the, um, all the different age groups. And that's a really, really good resource. And it's, and it's completely learning. The last way, I've just um, started using Twitter probably four or five months ago. And I've got involved with probably four or 500 other teachers around the world. Bubbles is one of them. And it's a really, really useful way where we can share ideas. And maybe you're not a teacher. So you don't, don't follow all the teachers. Maybe you're a rugby player, so you can follow all the rugby players and you can follow their tips. Maybe you're into something else which really floats your boat. Maybe you can follow those people. But it's a good way of getting feedback from other people and being able to involve yourselves with those other people. I think you guys, as young people, you've got a natural curiosity. And I think it's really important that you engage that to meet other learners who are on the same journey as you. Utilize what you've got to be thinking about, what is this new thing? And, but there'll be other people in the world who are thinking the same as you. Use that curiosity to your advantage and explore that. The main thing I want you to try and do is connect. Okay? I've, I've blanked. That's the biggest thing. Connect with other people. Really interact with them. Put something back. Trudy was really, really good in what she talked about, about being proud of the East Coast and being proud of the things which she's um, come across and sharing that with the rest of the world. And she was stringing the East Coast rugby game to um, thousands of people all around the world. There are people like you who are exactly the same everywhere. And you can connect and interact with those people. And I think that's something which you can do in lots of different ways now. And I think that's really, really important. Um, you guys have got the ability to free yourselves from your teacher's control. I'm a teacher. I'm not trying to put myself out of a job. But what you can do is you can explore and learn when you want to. You can free yourselves from the control that they put you in you in the classroom. And if you're really interested in something and think it's going to advantage you in the future, study it on the Khan Academy. If you want to look at how something that your teacher couldn't say us to do, study it on YouTube. <coughs> Some of you guys might not be too engaged at school, but this guy, Howard Gardner, he's still alive now. I think he was born in 1946. He came up with a theory of multiple intelligences. Every one of us in here is a unique blend of these um, eight, originally came up with seven, I think, these eight different intelligences. Just have a look. I'm going to let you think for about 20 seconds. Which intelligences do you think you are? Which blend of things? Tell the person next to you. That's what I want you to do. Tell them what you think. What do you think you are? Who are you? What have you got? <laughs> it's 
So I know, um, I know Trudy, who's just in here now, was really picture smart. She finished uh, Girls High Level 3, and she really enjoyed her art. But she wasn't encouraged to do that. But she still returned to it a few years later and came into videography. And she's been really successful with that on the East Coast. And that's really, really good. And if you can discover what your unique blend is, if you can discover what you're really into and embrace it and share it with the world, it's my opinion that's your path to an extraordinary life. And it's through these channels that you can actually do this. Once you've found this, now I chose this graphic for all you visual learners, for all you people that are engaged by looking and learning and watching. Once you find that particular thing that really turns you on, which really engages you, then you've found your flow. And your flow is something um, which is unique to all of you. And when you can find that, and when you can, um, it's like being in the zone. And you're doing something, and you're uninterrupted. My wife's an artist, and when she's painting in the room, and when she's getting into a, a really nice fine piece of artwork, I can't get anything out of her. I can shout, shout to her from one meter away, and she just completely ignores me. I'm not sure if it's um, because I'm her husband and I've been talking to her the whole life, but she just blanks me out. And I think that's part of finding your flow. And if you guys have found that already, you're extremely, extremely um, lucky. And it takes years and years for people to find that. Use these tools which I've spoken about today to help you find that and engage in that. So just a... Um, Quick recap, I want you to watch it or engage with it. Um, Liz Stevenson yesterday spoke about how she used video conferencing with a class to talk about um, environmental issues. And that would be an example of watching it. Her class then would um, get engaged with it and do it and be involved and be part of it. And then they'd seek feedback from world climate experts and see if they could do anything to improve it and make it better. What I want you to do is find the best example of what you're into and improve it. I don't want you guys to let your location limit your learning. Okay? I want you guys to make sure that whatever you're into can be fully maximised, you can share it with the rest of the world. And I think that's something, if you, if you take that away with you, something which you can really um, tell people about and um, let them know that what you're doing is really important. It's really passionate to you. And I think if you tell the right people, they'll listen to you and they'll... Um, embrace that and help you on that journey. I don't want you guys to let um, geography, where we are right now, get in the way of your dreams and your aspirations to be the best you can be. I think that's really important for you guys to just remember that. Now this video has got a few Londons in it and there are a few different Londons in the world. but. Uh, There are no grand celebrations here. No speeches, no bright lights. But there are great athletes. Somehow we've come to believe that greatness is reserved for the chosen few, for the superstar. The truth is, greatness is for all of us. This is not about lowering expectations. It's about raising them for every last one of us. Because greatness is not in one special place. And it is not in one special person. Greatness is wherever somebody is trying to find it. Achievement, yeah, huge personal achievement for him. And everyone's achievements are different, aren't they? And I'm not saying everybody's going to be a world-class athlete, and I'm not saying everyone's going to be in the Olympics, but if you find what you're good at and pursue that, um, that's going to make you happy, and that's what's going to really um, make your life worth living and sharing it with other people. To quote Mark Twain, I think he said, there's two really important days in your life, and the first one is when you were born. And the second really important day is the, is the uh, day where you find out why. And that's something which we can, you might have discovered already. But maybe you're on a journey to do that. Um, I chose this last picture, and this is the last slide I've got for you. And um, this is a picture of a nebula in Orion's belt. 
which is about 1,875 light years away. Really, really far. If you got in a car, or you couldn't drive there, but it would take you 800 years to get there. So you'd be a bit disappointed because you'd probably be dead. It's slightly further than Matawai. Um, but the reason why I took this is an actual real photograph taken with the Hubble telescope, which is in space, taking amazing pictures, really clear. Um, and I wanted to use it as a, as a vehicle to push the thing which I'm talking about is, some of you guys may never have seen this before. Some of you guys, this might be a completely new image, but it's there and it exists. And it's something that you can discover. And I want you to think about that as, as your flow. You might not know that it exists. You might not have discovered it yet, but it's out there and you can find it. And um, I want you guys to use these tools which we, we've got available to us now to try and discover that and embrace it and take, take yourself on that journey. I'm going to finish off with this, um, this quote. 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than the ones you did do. So throw off the bowlines, sail away from safe harbour, catch the trade winds and in your sails and explore, dream and discover. That's what I'd like you to do. Thanks. Any questions? There are all the images I got, by the way. Um, if you want to find any good images, use Flickr. Uh, there's some really great pictures on there. There's my Twitter. Email me, or um, I'll write a few things on a little blog, which is a good way that you guys can express yourselves too. Yes? That's the best one. There's a free one called um, Ubersense, which is good, but it's, does, it's less um, interaction. You can upload Coach's Eye to Google Drive and share it on Twitter and text it to people like in that picture. Yeah, it's good. I'll show you how to use it in a bit. I was going to do it live, but I knew that it would just go wrong and everything would break. Yes? How long does it take you to rewrite um, I'm 34 and... <laughs> yeah, do you want to measure me again? <laughs> I'm 34 and uh, I've been teaching in Gisborne for um, five or six years, but to be a teacher it took me four years of study at university. Um, but I decided I want to be a teacher quite early on. And that's my thing that I engage in. I enjoy it. I enjoy watching the boys like these four over here learn and develop. And watching from there are just little youngsters coming into boys' high to the good looking young men that they are now. So, <laughs> um, yes? I did look at iCoach um, and I found that this one um, here was probably easier for the boys to use, more intuitive, and uh, it was just really easy controls. Um, but I'll, I'll, what's how much time have we got? Are we lunchtime? Yeah, we're